video is the third um, in a series of tutorials around how to use iterators in Model Builder. Uh, it'll be slightly different format than the two that preceded it, in which I demonstrated a model and then we built it together. Uh, this one is just going to walk through three models that I've built. Um, and uh, also what we're going to be working on this one is something that might seem like uh, it's a little bit more basic than the other two, and it certainly is in the beginning, uh, but I'm choosing it as the third video because this is a concept that we can use to piggyback into something way more, uh, you know, radical is the wrong word. You can tell I get excited about ARC and GIS, uh, but at least downright interesting. And one of the things that really allows you to do some neat analysis uh, with model builder kind of takes root in this concept and it's this idea of four All right so if in previous tutorials we went through these ones down here to say okay I have 25 feature classes and I need to run through them and do the same thing or maybe something slightly different to each check right, we're not gonna have a video tutorial on this but the idea for these uh, field value you know if you have a series of values uh, that you're storing in a table and you want to pass those through to another tool you can go through each one and pass them through multi-value if you have multiple things stored in multiple different data sets feature selection and row selection that's a totally new um, you know kind of uh, concept here totally different than these two this one's saying give me a single shape file or a single table and I'll go through each component part very very neat and so when I end with this one, you're going to say, well, that's a little boring, you know, because all four really does, if I drag it in to show you, is it's really just saying, hey, give me some inputs from value one to value whatever. Right? So essentially what you're just setting up here is, yeah, you're allowing some values to be passed if you want, but really what you're doing is preparing rounds, right? Go through something four times. And... You know, as I started this video, that does seem pretty basic, and the first example I'm going to show treats it as such. But this tool I'm going to use to introduce a pretty cool concept uh, that takes its root here, something that's called uh, feedback variable, and uh, we'll see what that is in a couple of steps. But at our first example here, I've got East Falls, a little neighborhood, created one called 4Easy, and it's a pretty simple tool here, right? I start with 4. I'm going from value 1,000 to value 3,000 by iterative of 1,000, right? So I'm iterating three times, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, but I'm using values. And as you can see through my connection, those values are actually getting passed directly into the buffer, right? So I'm using East Falls, and look at that. My linear unit is shut down, right? It's not even hopping out because that's what I picked for my linear unit. I literally connected value here and said that it was the distance. So what's going to happen is three times through this tool is going to run, it's going to buffer at a thousand feet, then two thousand feet, then three thousand feet. Remember from previous videos when I encase something in percent, I'm saying take on whatever that value, so what you're going to see here is it's going to come back saying East Falls, right, or EF 1000, EF 2000, EF 3000. And I can even make that a little bit easier to understand. I can even go in here and say, why don't we just make that EF buffer? All right, so we can fully remind ourselves, I'm East Falls, I'm buffering, and I'm doing it by a certain value. All right, save it, run it, one and two and three. Super simple tool, and I'm going to actually save this and get out of it, because sometimes it messes up my uh, ability to, uh, to render graphics here. I'm going to zoom out. All right, 1,000, 2,000, and we started with East Falls. All right, so let's just look it out. I started at East Falls, and there we go. I buffered its edge at 1,000 feet. All right, and then I went the next round, and I said, hey, buffer East Falls by 2,000 feet, and then buffer East Falls by 3,000 feet. Super simple, right? That's the basic concept of a four. Next round, let's do it a little bit uh, more complicated. I'm going to make a quick group layer here that says four easy so I can store those if I want to use them again. I had another one that was a little bit more complex. Now, this looks almost identical if I open the two.
There is, however, a critical difference. So they both start out the same, right? Four, all right, between 1,000 and 3,000. I'm on my easy one now, 1,000 and 3,000. Storing that value, passing it through to the buffer, right? Same thing here with the buffer. But notice what happens here is I'm actually taking this buffer and I'm passing it back in to the tool. I'm creating here what's called a feedback loop. I mean, let's wrap our heads around this for a moment. I'm going to take something, I'm going to buffer by a thousand feet, and then I'm actually going to take that buffer and I'm going to replace East Falls with it. So the next time this tool runs, it's not going to buffer on East Falls, it's going to buffer on the old buffer. And then it's going to buffer on that buffer, and then it's going to buffer on that buffer. What we're doing here is taking an output, 10 things down the road, and passing it back in as the new input. Let's see how it actually plays out in action. One and two and three. Starting to look a little bit different, and we'll see the exact reason why. Let's get it set up in a way that it's easy to see. All right, before I even run through this again, oops, and I'm going to save both of these just because it's a little hard to be able uh, to render. Like I said, it was having some issues. All right, so when I did the first one, easy, right? Oops, Apple Mouse. Totally get it, right? You buffered on the outside only at a thousand feet. Very easy to wrap our heads around. Then you buffered at the outside only for two thousand feet. Very easy to wrap our heads around. And finally, three thousand feet. Totally fine. Totally easy to wrap our heads around. Let's do the complex. Starts out the same. But then remember what happens here is now this output, this outer buffer here becomes the new thing that's going to get buffered at 2,000 feet. What is a 2,000 foot buffer where you're only going on the outside look like here? Well, it looks like this. 200 feet on the outside, 200 feet. We think of this as an inside, but it simply just means, right, go from the edge outward instead of coming in. 2,000 feet that way. And that's the new shape we get. And now this shape is going to pass itself back in and be buffered at 3,000 feet. And what does a 3,000 foot buffer on this look like? It gets even kookier. It comes out here and then it goes in here. And it ends up looking something like that. So what we've done here, oops, oh dear, taking its time really is done what's called feedback loop. Right? So we're essentially taking an output and using it as another input. And I've got one more example of that that I call, or I thought I called Swiss cheese. And the reason it's called Swiss cheese, hopefully you'll see in a second. All right, I've got something here. Notice I'm not attaching the four. I'm not using the value here. The four simply exists to say I'm going from value one to value five, and I'm going in iterations of one. Right, so one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five. And each time, each time, each time I'm doing the same process, I'm going to pass one random point, or I'm going to create a random point, and I'm going to create that random point using East Falls as a boundary. I'm going to buffer from that point, and then I'm going to erase it. All right, now let's actually look at what the outcome looks like here before we get too deep into this tool. So I'm going to run this one. 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and so on and so forth. Essentially, here's what I've done with this. The process that I was setting up here was I was envisioning that what if you had to cite things randomly? Right, so imagine you're, um, you know, let's say Oops, let me make sure this gets deleted. 
so that we can actually see everything. Okay, so let's pretend that you have to cite something here. And then, I don't know, you're an artist, we'll say, for the purposes of this assignment. And you need to cite something randomly where you're going to do like your next mural or an exhibit in uh, East Falls. And so you cite something randomly here. Good, that happened in year one. Excellent. And eventually in year two, you're going to cite another um, installation. But you say to yourself, well, look, I don't want to have something where I you know, keep citing everything right around the same area here. Maybe I want to make it so that in year two, nothing within a thousand feet of this is eligible. And that's really what I did here. If you want to run back uh, to this tool, I created a random point, and then I buffered a thousand feet from that random point. And then I used that thousand foot buffer to erase an a thousand foot boundary in East Falls. So that now in year two, this would be the area that's eligible. And then I cited another point. Buffered that by a thousand feet. And then this is what would be eligible in year three. And that's happening because I am replacing East Falls each time. I am buffering and then cutting a hole with that buffer in what used to be East Falls and passing that back through. So now when the random points gets generated, it's only allowed to use the, you know, slightly smaller version of East Falls that's, you know, iteratively getting erased. And then I cite a third one. Right? And as you can see, each time there's been a site uh, citing, there's an 1,000 foot buffer that gets cut out in each subsequent round until we finally get to whatever the fifth area of eligibility would be, right, when all of those areas would be cut out. So for a fascinating kind of concept here, and the way you were able to create a feedback variable as I just did here, is you simply take something and drag it to connect as an input to something else. Another way you're able to do it is if you actually double click that input, oh my apologies, if you right click that input and go to properties, you can select what's called a feedback variable here. And remind it, hey, your feedback, you're supposed to take uh, right, right here, eligible value, as a feedback. That's essentially you. You're coming in and you're going to be, uh, you know, what replaces the old value with your new self. And just pause for a moment before we end this video and really think how cool this is as a concept. I mean, imagine you're modeling, and I'm doing a silly example here that I set up really quick to demonstrate the tool. But imagine you're, uh, you know, trying to predict development codes in an area. And maybe you need to take into consideration your development codes over multiple years that, uh, you know, for every new development that comes in, the landscape's going to change differently. And so whatever rules you design in year two, whatever happened in year one almost has to pass back into the tool for year two. You know, an example I used in, in one of my classes is imagine you have to cite bike share stations and you can build a whole uh, algorithm to help you pick out the best areas, you know, maybe places where there's, um, you know, a good relationship between where people work and where they live. Uh, you can preface, you know, certain very busy streets uh, or areas where the population is dense or around cultural sites, so on and so forth. But if you're building a program that cites bike stations, as an example, uh, over multiple years, you must realize that in year two, you're going to have considerations that you didn't have in year one. Namely, you might have the bike stations that you cited in year one. And maybe you don't want new bike stations to be near them, right? Or you don't want too many in an area. So suddenly you have a variable that you didn't have the first time you did an iteration. And this is what allows you to repass that back into the tool, knowing that it's going to be used in the second iteration. A super cool and interesting concept around how you use what are called feedback variables.